Ladies and gentlemen, those of you who are online, this time we're going to begin funeral services of Mr. Richard Sidney Mezzaro. Rabbi Eitan Weiner Kaplow from Shir Hadash Synagogue will be officiating. גם כי אלך בגי צלמוות, לא אירא רע כי אתה עמדי. Even though I walk through the valley of the darkest of shadows, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. So we begin these funeral services with the ceremony of Kriya, the ceremony for the tearing of the ribbons. And I'll ask for the children, for Debbie and Cheryl and Stephen, Mark and Brian, for you to place your ribbons on the left side. For children, the ribbons go over the heart. Sarah, your ribbon will go on the right side. And while you're putting your ribbons on, you'll notice that I did remove my mask as I'm in a place where I'm alone and removing my mask is, is, is safe. But I'll ask that those who are with others and feel that for health reasons you need to keep your mask on, I would say, of course, to follow all the precautions to keep everyone safe and healthy. Follow all the rules and precautions uh, that you need to do to keep everyone healthy. Our rabbis teach that this is the moment when we recognize the full reality of our loss. Now is when you become mourners. For in the days that have passed since Richard's death, it was hard to grieve and hard to mourn because there was so much to do. So many phone calls and emails to make, so many arrangements and meetings to have to prepare for this moment. But now that we have gathered virtually, family and friends, to begin the funeral services, now is when that transition happens and the immediate family, you can become mourners. Our rabbis teach that when we recognize the full reality of our loss, 
We recognize the tear that we feel so deep in our lives, the tear in our hearts, the tear in our soul, the tear in our family, the tear in our community, and beyond all the words that we can say now, we need to do something to reflect the tear that we feel so deep inside. And the rabbis teach us to tear, to tear a piece of cloth. And so in a moment, I'll be asking those who are wearing the ribbons to repeat after me word by word through the Hebrew, then phrase by phrase in the English. Please repeat after me. And if you wish, by the way, you could stand. Tradition says we stand, but if you'd prefer to remain seated, that's okay. Please repeat after me, Baruch, Ata, Adonai, Eloheinu, Melech, Ha'olam, Dayan, Ha'emet. And in English, please repeat after me, Holy One of Blessing. Your presence fills creation. You are the judge of truth. And now you can tear the ribbon either from the side or from the bottom. Tear it about halfway through and listen to the sound and know of the tear in your heart. These ribbons are assigned to you of the tear in your lives. Wear them for as long as you wish. In the traditional Jewish world, many will wear them for as long as you're sitting Shiva and even 30 days till Shloshim. In the liberal Jewish world, you can wear them that long or shorter, however you wish. My blessing to you is that healing will come soon. May healing come soon. You may be seated. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Dayan haemet Holy One of blessing, your presence fills creation. You are the judge of truth. Adonai natan v'adonai lakach Yehi Shem Adonai Mivorach. The Eternal One gives, the Eternal One takes away. May the name of the Eternal One be blessed. And so we have gathered here this day to remember, to memorialize, to say our farewell to Richard. Sydney, Mesereau. And we are saddened and we are grieved and yet we are here to give thanks for his life, to give thanks for the fullness of his life, to give thanks for his living life to the fullest and enjoying life in every aspect. His love of family, his love of his work, his love of travel, his love of life itself. Nevertheless, as we say our farewell, we do so as our ancestors have done over the centuries and over millennia, over thousands of years, by searching for comfort. Searching for comfort through the words of the Psalms, through readings of memorial and through prayer. And so I ask everyone who has gathered with us online, come together through Zoom to form this community. I ask everyone to join with Richard's family, with wife, Sarah, with children, Debbie and Joe, Cheryl, Stephen and Lori, Mark and Amy, Brian and Karen. With grandchildren, Ari and Stephanie, 
Nick and Jamie, Lucas, Jeremy, Jennifer, Benji, Bailey, Megan, Max, Daniel, and Brandon, Jacob, Haley, Claudia, and Addie. We join together as a community of family and friends, as together, as together we remember. Mizmor le David, Adonai ro ilo exar, Bihino te sheyar vitseni, Alame menuchot yenaleni. These words in the Hebrew, they introduce the 23rd Psalm. And for those amongst family who received a pamphlet at your homes today, I know that not everyone received one, but you can find on the inner panel, the 23rd Psalm. And if you'd like to join me by reading along at home, you are certainly welcome and invited to do so. The 23rd Psalm, these ancient words, which still speak to us today, they still bring comfort. 23rd Psalm. The eternal one is my shepherd. I shall never be in need. God makes me to lie down in green pastures, leads me beside the still waters, and restores my soul. You lead me in right paths for the sake of your name. And even when I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You have set a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Eternal One forever. In the rising of the sun and in its going down, we will remember him. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we will remember him. In the opening of the buds and the rebirth of spring, we will remember him. In the blueness of the skies and the warmth of summer, we will remember him. In the rustling of leaves and the beauty of autumn, we will remember him in the beginning of the year and when it ends, we will remember him. So long as we live, Richard too will live, for he is now a part of us as we remember him. When we are weary and in need of strength, we will remember him. When we are lost and sick at heart, we will remember him. When we have joys we crave to share, we will remember him. And when we have achievements that are based on his, we will remember him. So long as we live, Richard too will live. For he is now a part of us. He is in our hearts minds, our thoughts, our very being as we remember him, as we remember him. We are an ancient people and we are well acquainted with grief and the valley of shadows. 
Death and sorrow are not strangers to us. Yet the centuries have taught us that a good name, a good name endures forever. And so, with Job we say, Adonai Natan, God, you have given, you have given us, given us a loved one who will not be forgotten. And for all that was good and enduring in Richard's life, we offer the deepest thanks of our hearts. Adonai Lekach, God, you have taken away. And so we pray for strength to heal our broken hearts. And now we say, Yehishem Adonai Mevorach, Blessed be the name of God. Blessed be the name of the eternal source of life and love. Blessed be the name of the eternal one. Now and forever. There are so many stories to share about Richard. When we met to plan the service today, you told me how Richard was born, raised in Chicago, the son of Norman and Frida, brother to Judith, how he was quiet and studious, organized, played sports, Tell me about the many drives that Richard would take with his parents to the suburbs to go look at houses. He loved Camp Menominee. He loved the boating and the tennis and the golfing. Richard went to Evanston High School. He started his college studies at Brown and then continued at Northwestern University and then went on for an MBA at Northwestern. His father, Norman, founded Mesero Financial and Richard joined the company. There are so many stories to share, of course. And so at this time, I want to call on family and friends to speak. We'll start with Steve then Debbie, and we'll conclude with best friend Larry Marks. We would first like to thank Dad's caregivers, Ray and Emil. I thought they were terrific before, but this year they have literally faced danger taking care of Richard in a nursing home where COVID broke out. The family thanks you. We don't know what we would have done without your compassion and heroism. Richard Mesro was not only my father, he was one of my best friends, and we were able to work together for years. Not just at the same office, we had, but we had a common desk where for 14 years, the divider went up about chest high so that we could overhear each other and have a conversation throughout the day. Then we moved to about 20 feet away for another nine years so we could occasionally have a little privacy, but the running conversation continued. I don't, need, I don't mean to sound formal in my talk, but I often refer to my father as Richard out of force of habit. We thought dad at the office was a little unprofessional. We are lucky to have Richard as long as we did. I don't know if everyone knows this, but Richard had a major heart attack and quadruple bypass surgery when he was 39. The surgeon was happy with the result and told him that with good care, maybe this fix would last 15 years. He got 40 great years and a couple where his memory was fading, but he always had a great sunny disposition and attitude. He was a terrific father. He always made time for day-to-day -day stuff and we shared some big events together, like a few camping trips, treasure hunts, and going to the World Series. He was excited with life. When I was 16, I worked in his office for the summer and we took the train into the city for our commute. As we were among the mass of humanity walking from the train station to the loop, he starts bobbing and weaving his way through the crowd to get to the office faster. 
I couldn't keep up and I asked him, what's the hurry? Do you have a morning meeting you have to get to? With a big smile, he said, no, I'm just excited to get into the office. You never know what's gonna happen. As I reflect on his life and what he did and what he really enjoyed was helping people. His focus in life was seeing, is there a way I can help this person? He didn't understand, maybe that's not your business. Maybe that's not your problem or your domain. He would listen to people and think about how he might be able to aid them. Most of the people he helped, I have no idea. He didn't announce what he had done, brag about it or think it was special because he did it for his pleasure. He was just happy for the opportunity to help. Because of my proximity to him personally and professionally, I was able to learn about some of them, which I will now share. I'm probably lowballing this, but I can think of at least 10 people where Richard helped them get their first job or take that next step in advancement of their career. And I don't know how this started, but Debbie's friends all came to Richard for one-on-one -on -one career advice as they graduated college. And there was the time we went to Russia in 1988 on a family trip. We visited three Refusnik families and we brought in blue jeans, gym shoes, and other supplies for them to use or to sell on the black market. A year or two later, the Usum family, Pavel, Stalina, and Michael were given permission to leave. Richard sponsored them as a host family with the State Department so they could immigrate to the US. He got them an apartment. One of his friends is in the furniture business set up their place. Pavel was a chemist and Richard was able to get him a job at a pharmaceutical company. We also showed them some practical workings of living in America, like how a checking account works. Another example was when one of Richard's clients had a grandchild that they thought might be autistic. The family lives in a rural part of the country that does not have the same access that a major city has. Through his friends at Keshet, Richard was able to get this family the knowledge and the resources to know what specialists to ask for and what inf intervention they needed to get. One of my favorite family memories is Virginia's wedding. Virginia Diaz was 18 and I was just born when she came from rural Mexico and became our housekeeper and my second mother. We learned English together and Virginia became an integral part of our family. When she got married, she pulled Richard aside and said, I have a big honor for you. Will you be the godfather of godfathers for the wedding? He said, of course, I'd love to do anything for you, Virginia. Now, what does that mean? Virginia explained that at a Mexican wedding, there's a godfather of the dress, a godfather of the ring, the photographer, and each godfather pays for part of the wedding, so it's not too much for any one person in the family. The godfather of godfathers gets the dinner. Richard asked, how many people will be attending the wedding? Virginia said, I don't really know because aside from mine and Raul's guests, the other godfathers can invite people as well. During the service, Richard was seated up on the stage in a place of honor, and he keeps looking over his shoulder, trying to count full rows and do the math of how many people are here so he can know if there's enough food. The five of us and Richard's dear friends, Ed and Judy Biederman, served chicken dinner for 350 people. We're still in touch with Virginia 50 years later, and she just visited with Richard earlier this year. In 1999, one of Richard's friends, Michael Rolfe, died of pancreatic cancer. Richard was one of the founding board members of the Cancer Research Foundation in his name. Richard was very active in the board and hosted the meetings for years. Richard and Sarah and their travels went to Timbuktu in Mali, Africa. They liked their tour guide, Apane, from the Dogon tribe a great deal. They were going to give him a generous tip, but as Richard learned more about him, he found that Apane really wanted some cows. Money would be nice, but with cows, he could continuously help his family for years. So Richard found a way to get the man some cows. Richard and the Arts. Sedi is a wonderful classical music nonprofit which relied on a generous benefactor who passed away. Richard suggested their first fundraiser and hosted it in the firm's auditorium. This was a success and holding these types of events became a major part of their fundraising efforts. Richard and a few, few compatriots took this success and turned it into a series called Mesro Financial Presents where the firm hosted a dozen fundraisers at our auditorium for other, non, for other music and nonprofits that might not have their own building. The Chicago Children's Choir among others, which ties into one of Richard's crowning achievements, 
Annalise. Richard was at a charity event where he met the Lincoln Trio, a classical music group. Desiree, David, and Marta explained that they had recorded a meaningful piece of music in England that had never been performed in the US. Annalise, the diary of Anne Frank set to music. Richard became the executive producer, coordinating the musicians, the lead singer, the Chicago Children's Choir, the performance hall, and asking and getting the funding from the US Holocaust Museum to make this all happen. This was a complicated endeavor that took a year to pull off, and the result was a magnificent concert at Ravinia and at the Harris Theater in Millennium Park to celebrate the Holocaust Museum's 20th anniversary. What was particularly apropos about having the children's choir instead of an adult group like was done in England was that the age of the choir performers was about the same as Anne Frank. This also served the purposes of the children's choir whose mission is to broaden the horizon of its members. The children and their families got an education in the Holocaust and what happens to an individual when a society turns on each other. Lastly, one year for Hanukkah, Richard and Sarah said to their grandchildren, we are gonna give each family the best gift of all, the ability to help and give to other people. They found a service where you give microloans to individuals trying to start bus businesses in developing countries at no interest to help them get their venture off the ground. As they pay it back, you get to loan it to the next person. Each family was given an initial fund and had to pick which candidates and how much of their fund to give. I now wonder, over the course of his life, how many people Richard had a positive impact on? 40, 50, 100? How many of us can say that? Grandchildren, this is your legacy. Be a mensch and heal the world. Takun alum. In the spirit of honoring Richard's life, the family would like to do a service project in Richard's memory to, to reflect what he was really about. Unfortunately, we can't get together right now because of the COVID we will announce a project at a future date. And now, David and Desiree, the two musicians who introduced Richard to Annalise, have prepared a musical piece for Richard. Thank you. Would you like to play this little piece called Cradle Song by Dunier in memory of Richard?
I can totally see my dad smiling from listening to that. Thank you so much. In addition to being special to all the people he helped, our dad was even more special to those of us that loved him. Let me start with Sarah. Sarah and our dad built an amazing life together. They just genuinely enjoyed one another. They were regulars at art shows, plays, and movies. You could find them on the golf course, the tennis court, or holding court with their many friends at home, at Northmore, and in Palm Beach. And that's when they weren't jetting around the world, immersing themselves into different cultures and nature, including Af Africa, Antarctica, and numerous places in between. During the last four years, as our dad's health declined, Sarah's love for our dad was clear. She kept him safe and engaged to the best of his abilities to the very end. Sarah, you filled our dad's last 34 years with love and adventures and peace. And there are no words that can express our thanks and admiration. Our dad was always also very special to Cheryl, Steve, and myself. Many years ago, when my kids were young, Joe and I were out with a group of our friends. We were talking about what kind of parents we hoped to be. Every other person in the room said they wanted to parent differently than their parents had. I truly didn't understand what anyone was talking about. When it was my turn, I said, I hoped I could be as good a parent to my kids as my dad was to me. Our dad was a very hands-on dad. He was home every night for dinner where he asked us about our days and our friends. And we asked him about the Dow Jones Industrial Average. When we were little, we were all in the yard playing kickball and hide and go seek. He was on the tennis court feeding balls to us. He taught us to snow ski and water ski. We took trips every winter to the Doral Country Club and every summer to Camp Ojibwa for post camp. In each location, he had his legal pad in hand, full of the activities in which we were going to partake. One year, I am not exactly sure why, we drove up to Camp Ojibwa in an RV and the really special treat was the night we got to sleep in the RV with my dad. I'm sure there was a chart on his ever-present legal pad listing whose turn it was each night. During our teenage years, our dad was our cheerleader. He came to all our activities. He was at the basketball games to watch my pom-pom routines, at every Penguin show watching Cheryl and I in the pool, and at all of Steven's tennis matches. He took Steve on rafting trips and to four World Series. And he took all three of us to the Super Bowl when the Bears played. I'm not sure if he had more fun at that game or orchestrating the rerouting of all of everyone's separate flights to New Orleans after bad weather grounded all our flights. He was also creative and fun and planned great parties. I had the world's coolest Sweet 16 slumber party with 50 girls sleeping everywhere in our house, including on the floor in my parents' room. And before the days of escape rooms, he planned elaborate eighth grade graduation treasure hunt parties where we biked all over Highland Park, trying to solve clues that he had hidden all over town. And that is not to mention the politically incorrect war party Stephen had when he turned seven or my epic high school graduation surprise party, which through my parents' persuasion was the first event that Michael's ever catered. Our house was the hangout house for friends when I was in high school. While I would like to think that was because I was so much fun, I have already received emails from friends reminiscing about how they like to sneak out of the basement to come upstairs to talk with my dad. And when my friends were over, he would invariably walk in at the end of the night with a giant stack of pizzas to feed all of us which for reasons I still can't understand today was totally embarrassing to me. He was incredibly proud of us as we started our careers and he warmly welcomed our spouses as his own as our family grew. When my mom died right before Joe and I got married, he jumped right in to plan the wedding of my dreams. 
This time, his legal pad was filled with ideas for food stations, bridesmaid dresses, and flowers. And then he became a grandpa, 15 times. When I picture our dad as a grandpa, I see him surrounded by a slew of kids. He was on the floor playing Hungry Hippo, on the couch reading, and at Northmore Bingo, where in an unusual stroke of luck, almost all the Mesereau grandchildren won a prize. And he made sure that the one who didn't felt special too. His delight in his grandfather role was evident as he played each, as he planned each major birthday celebration for himself, intent on being surrounded by his loved ones. He reveled in it. He loved playing camp counselor again. Whether we were in Florida, Lake Geneva, or Chicago, he arranged beach contests, scavenger hunts, board games, and outdoor competitions for five different families. During these weekend extravaganzas, he was in, a, in his glory, once again, with his legal pad in hand, organizing all the festivities. But in addition to the fun times, our dad instilled important values in each of us. He did this by his actions as well as by his words. By his actions, we saw what it was like to be honest and kind and to act with integrity. We learned it was important to love what you do, love what you do, and to always do your best. He kept us grounded. We cleaned the kitchen every night after dinner, even though we had live and help. We had to weed the yard, even though there were gardeners. We had to have a job in the summers during high school and college, and there was no such thing as a kid's car. I remember him sitting me down when I was in college and discussing the importance of starting to give to charity. And we saw how he was always there to help someone, be it a family member, a friend, or just someone in need. That's just what he did. And it was truly his greatest joy. And through it all, we felt his unconditional love for the three of us. As the Mesereau grandchildren embark on the next stages of their lives, it is my sincere hope that they incorporate these same values into their lives. And as they hear more stories about their Poppy Richard over the next few days and weeks to come, that they share these stories about this very special man and instill these same values in their children someday. In this way, our dad's incredible legacy will continue to live on. Thank you, dad. I am so proud to be your daughter. On March 25th, 1937, Richard Mesero was born, dedicated to the proposition that taking on personal responsibility, caring unconditionally for family and friends, and living with integrity, honesty, and love was his creed. These qualities defined a mensch, which he personified. Richard and I chose to be each other's brothers nearly 70 years ago and have both experienced life-threatening illness, personal tragedy, as well as joyful times traveling, golfing, biking, eating, or just being together. We never missed an important occasion and remained in touch no matter where we were. Human relationships require time and energy. And both Richard and I were committed to always being there for each other. This is the ultimate in human connection. Words can be insufficient to describe integrity, character, and empathy. It's something that you see and feel, and you just know that it's there. That is the essence of Richard Mesereau. I will always be grateful that I had Richard in my life, as is my wife and my entire family. We are extraordinarily grateful to Sarah, who cared so deeply for Richard. 
Sarah has been and will always remain an important part of our lives. Thank you. Thank you all. So these are the things that Richard loved in life. Taking care of people, classical music, the arts, travel to Antarctica, Africa, Alaska, and not just to travel, but to be immersed in the local culture, tennis and golf and bike riding, and his work, so proud of his work at Mesero. Loved his family. For him, life was a pleasure. He enjoyed life. And what are the qualities that would describe Richard? Well, certainly that he was happy and pleasant lived life with dignity, that he was creative, that he was the camp director, as you heard, always with the legal pad under his, uh, his arm, always with him, planning the activities, meticulously organized, loving, kind, caring, and generous, humble. He was the one behind the scenes, honest, a straight shooter, what you see is what you get, a man with no pretense. We will miss you, Richard, and you will always be with us. May your memory always be for a blessing, and may you rest in peace. Amen. I've been told that there are 150 screens tuned in to this service this afternoon. And I'd like to share a reading that for me really captures Richard and all the things that have been said about him, about the things he loved in life, his legacy. The reading is called, He is Gone. It's by David Harkins. You can shed tears that he is gone, or you can smile because he lived. You can close your eyes and pray that he will come back, or you can open your eyes and see all that he has left. Your heart can be empty because you cannot see him, or you can be full of the love that you shared. You can turn your back on tomorrow and live in yesterday, or you can be happy for tomorrow because of yesterday. You can remember him and only that he is gone, or you can cherish his memory and let it live on. You can cry, close your mind, be empty, turn your back. Or you can do what Richard would want, to smile, open your eyes, love, live, and go on and go on. At this time, we continue with the chanting of El Malay Rachamim. This is the traditional Jewish blessing which asks that Richard's legacy live on, that his memory live on. And indeed it will because of all those who cherish and love him. All those whose lives 
or enriched by him. All the good deeds that he performed in this world, which have that ripple effect of creating more goodness. Legacies and memories do live on. So I'll be chanting El Malay Rachamim, and then we'll continue with the recitation of the mourners, Kaddish. In a moment, I'll be asking everyone to please rise, but I quickly add that for anyone who would prefer to remain seated or who has difficulty standing, of course you may remain seated while the rest of us stand. Please rise, everyone, as we continue with El Malay Rachamim and the mourners Kaddish. El male rachamim shochein bamromim hametzei menucha nechona tachat kanve hashchina im kedoshim uteorim kezohar harakiyam vazirim et nishmat Richard Ben Norman Ufrida Shahalach Leolamo Pahal Rachamim Yasti Rehu Beset Erkena Fav Leolamim Vaitror Bitror Chaim Et Nishmato Adonai I hunachalato ve yanuach bishalom al mishkavo ve nomar amen. Compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to Richard Sidney Mesero, the son of Norman and Frida, who has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let him find refuge in your eternal presence and let his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. For God is his inheritance. May he rest in peace. And let us say, Amen. We'll remain standing and prepare for the recitation of the mourners, Kaddish. And again, those who do have copies of this service folder, you can find the Kaddish on the back page. The Kaddish, the mourners, Kaddish is not about grief, it's not about sadness, it's not about death, it's not about loss at all. Kaddish means holiness. And the Kaddish is really about Chaim, life and shalom, peace. Our rabbis teach and instruct us to say this prayer at a time of our deepest sadness and our deepest grief and our deepest sense of loss for a very simple reason. Because we Jews, we are a people of life. And we celebrate life. Our rabbis teach that this is precisely the moment to rise amongst family and friends and through these words affirm that life is good that Richard's life was good. And through these words, we affirm that we will go on into life and we will bring Richard's memory and Richard's legacy with us unto life. Those who wish we join together in the mourner's Kaddish. Yit Gadal, 
ויתקדש שמי רבה. בעל מה דברה חירותי, וימליך מלכותי. בחיי חון וביומי חון, ובחיי דכל בית ישראל. בעגלה ובזמן קריב ואמרו, אמן. יהי שמי רבה מבורך לעולם ולעלמי עלמיה. יתברך וישתבח ויתפאר ויתרומם ויתנשא. ויתהדר ויתעלה ויתהלל. שמי דקורשה בריך הוא. לאלה מן כל ברכתה ושירתה, תושבחתה ונחמתה, דע אמירן בעלמה, ואמרו אמן. יהי שלמה רבה מן שמיה, וחיים עלינו ועל כל ישראל, ואמרו אמן. עושה שלום במרומיו, הוא יעשה שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל, ואמרו אמן. May the source of peace and peace to all who mourn, comfort to all who are bereaved, and no more and we say אמן. You may be seated if you wish. The words, Ose Shalom Bim Romav, the last line of the Kaddish. It says, May God, who creates peace above in the highest of heavens, bring shalom to us, to all Israel, to all who dwell on earth. Bring peace to our sorrowing hearts. Bring healing. Bring blessing. Ose shalom, Ose shalom, Ose shalom bim roma. Ose shalom, Ose shalom, Ose shalom bim roma. Shalom bim roma ve'imeru amen ve'imeru amen Go your way, for God has called you. 
Lech v'adonai yehiyeh imach. Go your way and may God be with you. V'halach lefanecha tzidkecha kvod adonai ya'asfecha. May your righteousness go before you, Richard. And may the glory of God receive you. In a few moments, we'll be concluding our service with some brief announcements. But before doing so, I'd like to just offer words of condolence and sympathy to the immediate family. Our rabbis teach that now that you have fulfilled your obligation for memorial, now is when you can truly hear our words of condolence and sympathy. And so to all those extended family and friends who are online right now, I ask that you join me in repeating the traditional words of condolence and sympathy, speaking them to the mourners. Please repeat after me. May God comfort you with all who mourn in Zion and Jerusalem. In Hebrew, we say, Hamakom yenachem etchem betoch sha'ar avilei tzion Yerushalayim. As you go forth from this time, may you come to know comfort May you come to know peace. May you come to know healing. May you come to know shalom. Peace. This concludes the services, memorial contributions in his memory to the Alzheimer's Association, the Rolf Pancreatic Cancer Foundation, for the fair fight that information is all on our website. Thank you for attending.